welcome to Inside the Admissions Office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Ellen, and each episode I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office and will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips that will help you get into your dream school. If you'd like to chat with one of these experts, you can sign up for a free consultation at the link in the description of this episode. Today, we'll hear from Heather McCutcheon, a former admissions reader at Dartmouth, and Mary Chabanian, a former application reader at Harvard and Barnard, about the recent 2021 National Association for College Admission Counseling Conference and the insights they gained while attending. Hi, Heather. Hi, Mary. How are you both doing today? Hey, uh, thanks, Ellen. So just to start off with, Heather, could you introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Yeah, sure. I'm Heather McCutcheon, and I went to Dartmouth as an undergraduate. I worked as a professional writer for many years and actually started writing for the admissions office there before I um, was reading applications. I was working on their website and kind of how they wanted to present themselves to students. And I found the work just really, really interesting. I became interested in the whole process and in how applications to me are like a form of storytelling. So as a writer, that really interested me in kind of how each kid can tell their story in like 12 pages. So I started actually reading applications as well and have been involved in admissions and counseling and working with schools mostly in the Ivy League, gosh, for 30 years now. I have three kids of my own. The first two also went to Dartmouth and then went on to Harvard Graduate School of Education and Boston University Law School. And my youngest is actually a senior in high school applying to colleges right now. So this year's admission cycle has had special significance for me because I'm looking at it from a personal standpoint as well as, you know, a work one, um, trying to help all my students, but also the one who's in the house with me. And Mary, could you tell me a little bit more about yourself and your admissions experience? So I have degrees in history and education from Dickinson College and Villanova University and Harvard. I worked in higher education in various capacities, both including admissions as well as development, for example. So I've worked at Dickinson College, my alma mater, Barnard College, which is the all-women's college connected to Columbia University in New York City, uh, New York University, University of California, San Diego, and Harvard Law School. I have extensive experience in both secondary and higher education. So having taught my classroom and have been on that side of the desk as well as in higher education. Generally, though, a career of over 10 years in education, my mission involves advocating for equitable access to quality education for all students worldwide. And could you guys maybe tell me what the National Association for College Admissions Counseling is? I I can start the NACAC, as it's referred to. Uh, Very... uh, funny acronym, you'll hear all the regional associations as well. So the national organization is, of course, at the uh, U.S. federal level, but there's also regional associations. So New York ACAC, Pennsylvania ACAC, Rocky Mountains ACAC, and they'll just refer to them as NIACAC, PACAC, uh, NIACAC, PACAC, um, etc. <laughs> but all in all, it's a professional association for individuals involved in college admissions, in the college admissions process. So that includes admissions and financial aid officers and enrollment leadership on the university side, as well as high school counselors, independent college counselors, even nonprofit organizations and community-based organizations on the secondary school side, as well as, let's not forget, (laughs) the testing and other related services that are provided for students in particular in that process. So it includes like the Princeton Review and the College Board as well. NACAC has a leadership governing board and bylaws that articulate policy in admissions, as well as committees that are focused on specific aspects of the college admissions process, like diversity, equity, inclusion, government relations, and as I mentioned, the regional association. So they're smaller associations that connect with the national association. Yeah, and this conference is an annual event where 
representatives from all those groups come together and kind of share best practices, look at trends regionally and nationally. It's just a great opportunity to kind of get a grasp of what is happening in the big picture. You know, if you're working with one school, it's so helpful to get a sense of what's happening outside of your bubble, what's happening at other schools, sharing information, sharing predictions. It's just a really helpful exchange of ideas and support. Have either of you attended previous conferences? I have not. Nope. Yeah, I previously had not um, attended a NACAC conference, the national conference. Um, when I was in admissions, that was generally reserved for admissions leadership because it was, you know, again, at the highest level, it was the largest association, the national association. So like my dean and vice president would attend. I did, however, attend regional conferences. As an admissions officer, I managed territories, as in, in other words, you know, uh, worked with students, counselors, and, you know, organizations, families, et cetera, in certain areas of the United States and abroad. So I would attend regional conferences, for example, the New York ACAC, the Pennsylvania ACAC, and the New England ACAC, and very similar to the National, or NAC Act, the National Conference. These are much more regionally focused. I also previously was on two regional associations governing relations committees. So there's also you know, as I mentioned previously, the committee. So I actually conducted legislative visits at the state and federal level as well to kind of push higher education policy. What topics were the focus of this year's conference? Well, the conference covers a huge range of issues. There's lots of sessions and each individual participant can kind of choose sessions of interest or relevance to them. Mary and I actually kind of put our heads together and split up some of the sessions so that we could cover more areas. So I attended almost all of the sessions that had anything to do with testing and standardized testing and the new kind of optional testing practices, what we've seen in the past year because of the pandemic. The broadest level of what was addressed at this year's conference in particular, you know, it's all these different topics coming together. But I'd say broadly, this conversation of how colleges were adapting they were and are still adapting to the, you know, to changes during the COVID-19 pandemic yeah. and they how they're, adapting. yeah, <laughs> huge conversation. I'd also mention that, you know, there was, you know, relevant conversation and discussion around like race, justice, and equity after the U.S. and parts of the world confronted widespread kind of civil unrest following murders of numerous BIPOC individuals. So I would say it was generally, you know, uh, addressing kind of what worked, what didn't work, or you know, what's, what's really important the issues that are coming from those two significant ongoing global events. So, yeah, and, and um, I think those things influenced pretty much all the topics. So like when yeah. I was listening to testing sessions and they were talking about optional testing, it was a lot of conversation about how does that impact BIPOC students? Um, how mm -hmm. are colleges seeing their, their demographics change? What are the goals? Right. How to preserve the best aspects of test optional policies? I attended more sessions on like financial aid and scholarship, you know, as during the pandemic, our, our, uh, the U.S., but also parts of the world, of course, impacted by, you know, the halt of different global economies. And now we're facing hyperinflation. You know, so the reality of the cost of college, the cost of post-secondary education, of course, there was conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion, and even, you know, I attended some sessions on leadership development. So thinking about, you know, DEI at the highest level, how can we make sure that there's appropriate representation at the highest level in college admissions? Um, there was also, I, I attended some sessions on alternative pathways to college, which was definitely a conversation that's been had for several, you know, many, many years, but was a little bit more relevant now as, of course, international students and even domestic students are, you know, considering, like, you know, how do I, how do I attend college now in just this, this ever-changing world? What new insights did you gain more specifically? So I didn't attend as many testing sessions as Heather did. Um, I did recognize that there was kind of a less emphasis on standardized testing in terms of admission evaluation. It was what are some alternatives? What are colleges doing as testing becomes optional out of necessity or just, you know, by policy or choice? Additionally, I attended sessions on students needing to write more essays, how to write those essays. So a lot of nitty gritty uh, writing, <laughs> writing process sessions. Of course, the reality of top schools have become even more selective. So how do we have conversations with students? 
and their college list? How do we have conversations and change, you know, the cultural perspective of family? And, you know, as we craft college lists and consider school research. Additionally, there was a lot of conversation in the sessions I attended on virtual resources for students. So expanding access, which is actually, you know, it's really phenomenal, but it was, you know, evaluating what worked and what didn't work with regard to communication, programming, visits. And I also saw attending some financial aid and scholarship sessions that there is a push for, of course, improved transparency around costs, almost, I should say, out of necessity that it's, you know, no longer something that colleges can kind of dance around, but it's something that communities, families, students are demanding. So there's been, you know, of course, the net price calculator being utilized by students and families, but additionally, um, the financial fitness tracker, you know, evaluating how colleges look financially in all honesty out there to the public. How are they doing in terms of their financial funding and their endowment during this really difficult time? And then, you know, there were so much, so many questions being asked and, and relatively few answers about the test optional <laughs> policies um, because it's such a new phenomenon, really. There's a handful of schools that have been test optional for a long time. So they've certainly had a louder voice. But of over 300 test optional schools from newly test optional from during the pandemic, um, only 21 had released their detailed test optional admission stats to NACAC at the time of the conference. So there was a lot of scrutiny of those 21 schools trying to look for patterns in ways that can be helpful to counselors. And I think also for peer institutions to look at kind of what their neighbors are doing, um, how they're considering, what do they mean when they say test optional? Because that was such a new concept for all these schools and, and students and counselors alike. We're kind of at a loss to to answer those questions. What does test optional really mean? Do they not, do they mean it? Do they not mean it? Do you have to have a good reason? Does it matter? All of those questions were certainly on the front of mind for uh, my students uh, last year and this year. So looking at the results from the 21 schools that did give data, uh, NACAC kind of broke them down into three categories of test neutral schools that whose results really indicated that they did not care it was there was no impact to the results process whether a student submitted test scores didn't submit submitted high scores submitted low scores that they really did not factor in the testing and then the test aware where if a student sent the scores they mattered and if they were lower than the average that that would hurt them. And if they were higher than the average, that would help them. And test preferred, which were schools that clearly preferenced students who had high testing. And not only were students who sent low testing disadvantaged, but students who sent no testing at all were at a significant disadvantage. And I think this is going to be really important in the future for colleges. That transparency question applies here as well for colleges to be more transparent about what they mean. And I know some of them have tried. I know my alma mater, for instance, Dartmouth sent out a letter to students saying like, we're not kidding. We're not winking. We're not saying test optional, but really we want to see them. Like we don't need an excuse. We just want you to make the decision that's best for you. And that's it. And I still, every single one of my students who applied to Dartmouth didn't believe them and wanted you know, me to ask more questions of the admissions office there and dig deeper and what do they really mean and what do they really want. So there is this just kind of hesitancy to let go because we've depended on testing for so long. So I think this, this kind of data is going to be super important in the future as kids make that decision. You know, in my own house, my son made the decision that he was not going to focus on standardized testing. He wanted to do his activities. And if colleges were going to give him permission not to spend hours in SAT prep and not to spend hours taking the test three times, that he was going to take that chance. And he was, he was going to throw himself into the things he loved and not spend time doing this thing that he hated. He didn't really ask me for any data or opinions about what, that decision. He just made it. And, you know, I don't know how that's going to go for him. At some of his schools, I think they're test preferred. And I think it's going to hurt him at some schools. But we, you know, we will see. So do you have any insight just generally, like which schools might be test preferred? So, I mean, we can make some generalizations. There are exceptions, of course, to every one of them. In general, it looks like top 20 schools are going to be test preferred. Now, having said that, since the conference, Cornell has announced that they're going to be test optional another year. 
So mm -hmm. what's interesting is because of some of the recent lawsuits, the peer institutions cannot talk to each other about these decisions, right? So like Dartmouth can't talk to Cornell and say, how did you make that decision? Or talk to UPenn and say, what are you going to do? They're each in their own little silos making these decisions until a decision is made. So that's been a, an interesting factor as well. I sit on the Dartmouth alumni panel for enrollment. So we meet with the Dean uh, several times a year and kind of hear these updates. And that was one of his sources of frustration as they try to make decisions going forward is not being able to know what their peer institutions are doing. But generally speaking, looking at the schools that responded, you know, it's, it's mostly very competitive um, schools. It's interesting some of the technical schools, right? So it kind of makes sense to me at that at a technical school, that sort of hard data is, is really useful to them. And there was a sense in general from the schools who presented that to most of them, testing, even if it's optional, when it's available is a useful tool. And they don't wanna just throw it out and say, we're test blind, don't send, like, they feel like students who do well on tests should be able to submit that data to them and that it's useful to them. It kind of leaves students in this in-between space of do I or don't I? How much time do I put into it? Do I do I start studying sophomore or summer and going to SAT boot camp? Like they, they don't know how to make those decisions right now. On the test neutral end, there are a couple of surprises, some some very competitive schools on there as well. It's hard to draw, it's hard to draw the patterns right now. Being test optional or test neutral increases admission numbers. More students will throw in an application who might be intimidated otherwise. So for schools who are looking to increase the number of applications for a multitude of reasons, being test optional comes with that big advantage. For schools that are already so competitive and receive so many applications already, that's less of a positive for them. They're looking for yeah. ways to evaluate and uh, make decisions in the pile and any mm -hmm. data point they get is helpful. So, you know, they're all looking at applications holistically. The vast majority of schools in the U.S. are looking at all the data points, but each one of them is helpful. Yeah, and I and I know there's been celebration, of course, for some of these ultra selective schools, the uh, Ivy Plus schools you know, having increased diversity in their incoming class. My, my also alma mater, uh, Harvard celebrated, you know, one of its most diverse classes. And uh, Heather, to your point, I think really interesting also, not just are students able to prepare for the SAT, but from the position of like accessibility, you know, there's been a number of students who already can't in populations of students who cannot access testing even before, you know, pre-COVID. And now yeah. it's been an increased challenge for them thinking of you know I previously worked with indigenous students so mm -hmm. you know some students who you know can't even access a test center that's two hours away off the reservation already it's becoming increasingly challenging and they have you know they kind of sit on both ends of that same spectrum of like this is really exciting testing doesn't matter but as soon as they learn some inside information in terms of you know we're test neutral or we're test preferred or we're, you know we're not so sure you know how we're going to be utilizing testing in our applications this year, they get extremely nervous. Um, and those are the same students who are obviously very qualified for schools like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, etc. So I thought it you know at least a nice relief to see that a school like Harvard you know, has been able to craft a really diverse class in spite of some of these challenges and, and evaluating students holistically. I think that holistic aspect and to to be sure that, you know, our listeners do understand holistic admissions. It's the idea mm -hmm. that, you know, you're not just a GPA or you're not just a test score. The idea that every aspect of your application from your essays to your activities list, to your interview, to your possibly your visit onto campus if they incorporate demonstrative interest, but every aspect that you're presenting on the application is important. But I think, you know, to your point as well, Heather, the kind of less selective schools or, you know, kind of outside the top 20 or even outside the top 30, mm -hmm. these opportunities to kind of have increased applications can be really meaningful because they already practice the holistic admissions. They um, are really interested and able to track you know, very particular students for, you know, potentially a smaller college that has a very specific mission, et cetera, a specific program. But again, you know, uh, one thing that's definitely been a stressor with my students is, you know, this conversation of, do I, am I able to get into Yale, for example? And the answer is yes, but it's not, 
because of the increase, you know, kind of the bottlenecking at all these top, top schools with increased access to, you know, again, these top 10 schools, top 20 schools, um, the number of applications is just so overwhelming that our strategy to help these students get into these schools is one thing, but also having the conversation of your worth and your capacity of getting into these schools and your ability to thrive in them is not, not so much up for debate. It's that they have, you know, these admissions officers have extremely difficult decisions to make and they might really, really love you. They just don't have the space. And right. um, having those realistic conversations with students can be, I found just increasingly stressful because again, they, a lot of these high achieving students associate self-worth or associate success with admission to some of these top schools. And it's difficult to go beyond, are you qualified to, you are qualified, but there's not space. Right. So that's also difficult. Yeah, absolutely. And another interesting thing that came out of that discussion about just the magnitude of applications, you know, we've always as admissions officers for decades emphasized holistic admissions and the idea that like a computer can't do what we do, right? There's no line to draw, but there was a big conversation around artificial intelligence and what some of the AI programs now can learn to do and whether they can learn to do some of the applications sorting and evaluating beyond just GPA and SAT scores. And mm -hmm. I think that'll be an interesting thing to watch in the future. If these massive numbers of applications continue, I think that you will find schools who could save an enormous amount of money by using an AI system to sort through the first round. I think that that's going to happen. So that's going to be, again, another big game changer. I think there's going to be a lot of evolving, adapting. Colleges can't mm -hmm. keep up with the mm -hmm. level of increase that they saw last year is not sustainable under mm -hmm. the models that they have right now, right? They either mm -hmm. have to hire more people, which is a huge budget number in a time when their budgets are crushed or they have to, you know, read applications more quickly or fewer times mm -hmm. or, you know, there something has to give in the system. So there was a lot of discussion around kind of different possibilities, what that might be. So I think mm -hmm. there are no answers, but there's a lot of questions and, you know, watch this space to see um, how that evolves over the next yeah. five years. Another thing um, is kind of the counterpoint to the less emphasis on testing was just the higher emphasis on GPA. And mm -hmm. um, I saw a couple of presentations, charts and data about uh, seeing an increase on that importance, that ad admissions decisions being defined statistically more by the high school GPA. And that is something that I, you know, I take right to my students and say like, the stuff that I can help you do is the icing on the cake. You have to bake the cake. The cake is your GPA. The cake is your transcript. And you have to mm -hmm. bake that. Like I can help mm -hmm. you choose ingredients, but you have to bake it. You have to have a good GPA if this is the school you want to get into. That's just more important than ever. And um, I really, I see that happening uh, and students starting to process that more. Whereas even five years ago, I think there was more of a sense of like, eh, my GPA is not the best, but I'm going to ace the SAT. But that would, you yeah. know, compensate. And I think increasingly, yeah. it, that's just not the case. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely have had increased conversation about, like, meaningful activity. And when students are evaluating, you know, their activities, for example, you know, to, you know, counterpoint the, the GPA conversation, it feel like more students are balancing you know, their priorities with regard to schoolwork yeah. and their performance in school with their activities and leadership and their experience there. Because the, the activities offer an opportunity, a, a distinct opportunity to distinguish themselves, to set themselves apart from others who have a similar GPA, who have tackled similar coursework or take advantage of certain academic opportunities. So I constantly have conversations of how do I hold this balance? And even students yeah. apologizing, oh, I haven't, you know, been able to, you know, pursue this additional activity yet. And it's like, if you're going to compensate your schoolwork, you know, then it's not worth it. So it's, it's definitely this very careful balance in every it's conversation tough. that I'm having with students. So it's, yeah, it's really I don't hard. envy them. It's and difficult the, to have these conversations. And in the pandemic, like, I think we definitely see the stress level increasing in all of our mm -hmm. high school students and um, just kind of an interesting, like, line in the sand that more and more of my students are drawing like i'm not willing mm -hmm. to do this 
Like mm-hmm. I've made a decision of what is good for me. Even if it is more strategic for me to do X, I'm not going to do it. Which I, you know, I think it's awesome to see teenagers like have that more autonomy like that. But it's the shift. It's a shift from what we've seen in the past. Mm-hmm. I also think it's tied up some in some in the social justice movements. Um, Absolutely. Which kids are so passionate about social justice at the high school level. Yeah. Part of the reason, um, you know, that my son and some of his friends refused to take the standardized testing was that they knew had so many friends who just didn't have access to prep and they said Mm -hmm. that's not fair i'm gonna go spend three months this summer prepping and my my best friend from school like will never see a prep test and like has to do online but he doesn't have internet that's not Mm -hmm. fair so i think i think the kids voices are coming into the conversation more than ever as well in terms of what activities matter to them what they have time Mm -hmm. for where their Mm -hmm. limits are yeah you know when I was in high school I didn't I didn't do test prep either because I had like a little like one woman protest against um inequity Mm -hmm. and standardized tests which listeners of this podcast will know I always bring up in pretty much every episode I I think the admissions officers probably thought I was just bad at math though I think I should have like found some part of my application to say like this is a one woman protest um but when we're talking about AI and we're thinking about AI in other industries, we often see that these algorithms are recreating bias that already exists. So was there any discussion about how in higher education, mm. these algorithms, this AI will be kind of adapted so it's just not recreating these barriers that already exist to equity? Yeah, that's a really good point. There were, I mean, of course, it's all theoretical right now, but the discussions definitely emphasize that, how important that would be. And, you know, the the proponents of trying this out felt very confident that, you know, computers have reached a point of sophistication where they can do that, you know, where they mm-hmm. where they can evaluate what's available to a student not just what did they do, but what were the opportunities mm-hmm. available to them? What were their circumstances and take context into consideration, which is, I think, at the heart of the holistic admissions process is context, mm-hmm. like looking at mm-hmm. each kid in terms of, you know, oh, they're a swim captain. Great. But they, you know, live in a town where every home has a private pool and they're in the country club team and their, you know, their access to swimming is not hard for them. Somebody else who's a swim captain in a place where, you know, they have to travel an hour on the bus to get to the pool. That's a different, you know, accomplishment. And Mm -hmm. each, each accomplishment, those aren't the same. Those aren't the same. That swim captain accomplishment is not the same. And so Mm -hmm. for me, holistic admissions is about looking at the context piece. Somebody who took 25 APs, but that's what everybody at their high school does. It's different from somebody who takes three APs and nobody at their high school has ever taken one before. Mm -hmm. That's a a different kind of accomplishment. Yeah. And I think it'll be extremely important, you know, alongside incorporating something like AI to extend education, you know, education about what it means. Because already we have conversations about the art versus science of admissions um, in the sense that there is business modeling involved. There is like lists that are generated, but at the same time, there is a human that's reading your application. So there's some level of reassurance as well as, you know, there's a conversation and increased conversation about bias training, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, that um, in each time that I've read for a different school, there's been, you know, bias evaluation conversations around bias. Also, there's multiple rounds of, you know, application review. Um, And so I think that the incorporation of AI, there's going to have to be, again, this education of what it means and how it's going to benefit populations and not detriment these populations. And education is definitely one of the heaviest lifts, but certainly, of course, with, you know, addressing these cultural shifts across the across the world um, as a result of the pandemic and racial injustice, et cetera. This is, this is the inevitable change. This is the, you know, this is the opportunity. I know this was a conversation, kind of a theme of NACAC as well, was like, this is an opportunity for positive change because the change is happening. It's inevitable. And this is an opportunity for us to to make positive impact. Yeah, so, it was um, just a sense at the conference of like, this is a reset. We have a reset opportunity mm-hmm. and let's try to make it better. It's not a process that I think can ever be perfect. It's always no. going to be flawed and it's always going to be unfair uh, mm-hmm. to a certain level, but I think it can certainly be better. So how did what you learn at the conference, how has that shaped your work with your students this year? I think I came away from the conference feeling positive about what we do and feeling like this is a community of people who really 
care about students. You know, admissions officers have good hearts. They want to make good decisions. They like the kids whose applications they read. They get attached to the stories. Um, they want to be able to be fair. They care about social justice. Like all of those things matter. It's not a cold hearted industry. And I think that that's something that I do emphasize to my kids, like, you know, one comma error. It's not a cold hearted industry that's going to, you know, write you off um, because of you know, a small differential here or there. What matters most is your overall story, the arc of your story, of what you're passionate about, what you've done, what you care about, who you've helped. That's what matters, you know, on top of the metrics, on top of having the GPA and the leadership, you know, those things. So there's kind of the long, the long process of, of reaching that. Yeah. And just, um, you know, I felt more slightly more confident about kind of making the decision of whether or not to submit test scores in this environment. I felt a little more confident about how to make that call. And I think for the a lot of my students, it varies, right? Unless they have a simply incredible test score, the answer is different for different colleges, depending on where they're applying, what the stats are, what that college has said publicly about their feeling about being test optional, um, whether or not the application asks what your excuse is, right? There are some applications that say, well, why don't you have testing? So clearly, you know, they're sending a message, but you know, they care about the testing and you should have an excuse, right? So that's mm -hmm. different from a school that's saying like, you make the choice for you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just definitely say confidence in the information sharing last year was really challenging and being able to evaluate things, you know, decisions and strategies from testing to topic of an essay, school lists, et cetera. So, you know, as Heather touched on testing, I'll mention college lists, you know, being able to, you know, have greater confidence in crafting the college list. And, you know, of course, one thing Ingenious ensures is that students have balanced college lists. So, you know, being able to have these, you know, really candid conversations with students about the reality of admissions at this point in terms of, yeah, you really like Yale and you're qualified, but the likelihood of you being admitted is you know, their, their admission rate dropped this past year. So, you know, we have to be careful about what Yale looks like up against the rest of your, your, the other schools that are on your list that are similar to Yale that can be target and safety options for you as well. So I also have had increased conversations addressing, you know, as Heather mentioned earlier, mental health. I've had increased conversations about student stress levels and having conversations about stress management and strategies around stress management, um, around time management as it correlates with managing stress. Um, you know, encouraging students to really avoid procrastination for one, you know, and the emphasis, of course, thankfully, the genius places on internal deadlines that are much earlier than an actual deadline. And so, you know, helping students really stay on track, still enjoy this process of admissions, finding and discovering their different schools they end up falling in love with and are admitted to and choose to enroll at. So finding ways to, to address the, the mental health issue, finding ways to kind of work with that and support students during this increased, really, really stressful time. So I, I've found that, you know, that's been definitely something that's changed um, in my, you know, in my conversations, um, generally with students having very honest conversations about where they are and where their parents are, where their families are, where their friends are, for example, in terms of college lists and top schools versus safety schools and where they want to be going, even in terms of, you know, working with international students, what's the safety of going to the United States versus I'd be applying to more UK schools or schools in Canada or Singapore, Hong Kong, et cetera. Even with grade 11 students, as we talk about college visits and as schools and campuses reopen, some of them are still hesitant about visiting college campuses. So it's been really nice to be able to take some of the resources and conversations that we had at NACAC to have conversations with my students about how to visit and communicate with schools in different, you know, different ways that aren't, don't involve in person that might not, you know, affect their, their schedule so much, you know, that, that offers them, you know, greater access, offers them some level of reassurance. And to Heather's fair point that on the other side of the line is someone who is more than willing to answer questions. So helping them also craft emails and connect with admissions counselors and feel like the personal aspect of admissions is still there in spite of increase or uh, decrease in rate, you know, at top schools stress about finances at all schools, stress of creating a college list that's appropriate for both them and the reality of today and their parents and their friends. So it's, you know, recognizing that there's, there's 
a network of support that they can be utilizing and identifying that for them is really, really, really important. So in spite of all the technological changes happening in missions, for example, again, recognizing and, and drawing attention to the kind of the personal aspect in spite of, you know, maybe not being able to see an admissions officer come to your school or not being able to physically be on that campus. Um, and only having, for example, a former admissions officer to talk to or a college counselor at their school to talk to about this whole process. So there's been a lot of honest conversations and um, NACAC definitely has helped in you know, drawing attention to really, really important issues and relaying that information to my students. And, you know, again, kind of adjusting the strategies that we use in conversation as well as admissions, you know, the, the admission strategies that we use at, at Ingenious as well. So. It's been really useful, been really valuable, but it ends on a very high note, as, as Heather mentioned, you know, like the people aspect is still there. The community aspect is still there. So there's also a recognition that we're part of this large community um, as a national association of college admission counseling, that it's building this bridge across the desk between higher education and secondary education in order to continue to effectively support students. So even though it's a little messy right now, change is being made. The transformation is meant to be in support of, of their well-being and in support of their success. Did your time at the conference lead you to have any maybe unanswered questions? Did it leave you with any new hypotheses about the future of college admissions? Like, where has it left you as, as it is like looking towards the future? I'm definitely trying to be positive, trying to be optimistic. Um, this has been a really important turning point for education, specifically, of course, college admissions. So this is an incredible opportunity that we can take advantage of to incite transformational positive change in a really, really broken system. Um, having studied it extensively, I'm pretty pessimistic about admissions and knowing its history. We've come a long way, but we have a lot further to go. So it's just, you know, we're in the middle of this change. We're in the middle of this transformation. You know, and we hear this at the end of every conference we attend, but I really appreciated it after NACAC where, you know, it was this continued, after every session, this continued agreement that it's like this conversation cannot end. We need to continue these efforts together. And that collaboration was extremely important and emphasized that, you know, it's not just about attending this conference and taking information or walking back to your school or to your college or to your, to your company, to your business, to your home, and, you know, kind of process that information and use it in your work. But it's about, you know, building connections and continuing this, this effort toward, you know, positive change to support students. You know, I think that another theme that I felt emphasized at the conference that I, I do share with my students is this idea that there are hundreds of amazing schools, right? When you listen to some of the presentations, you're not, you're not just listening to top 20 colleges, you're listening to colleges at all different levels. You realize how absurd the ranking process is. And I've been trying to emphasize that more to my students that First of all, the rankings change from year to year. And if you look at it over the decades, it's it's kind of comical. You know, s schools that were safeties when I was applying to college are now, you know, under 20% acceptance rate. So I think thinking just about competitiveness, thinking just about um, rankings is really a disservice to the kids. It should be more about what they're interested in what's a good fit for them, places where they will be happy. And I do see increasingly, like obviously they don't really consider that for their reach schools, for their dream schools. They want, you know, everybody wants their dream school, their reach school to be something really impressive. But I, increasingly I see for the fit schools and for the safety schools, that students are willing to, to listen to that message that there are so many great schools and the one that's best for them isn't necessarily, you know, the, the most famous or the highest mm -hmm. ranked today. There's a lot of rankings and you can look yeah. at, you can look at school a lot of different ways. Yeah. I'm, I personally am kind of anti standardized testing and, you know, these rankings, um, having a, having studied uh, the history of higher education at Harvard, there's a reality there that's really difficult to relate to students because of course it requires a cultural shift. You know, having a conversation mm -hmm. with someone who's who has their eyes set on Yale and it's like, you know, trying to encourage them to look elsewhere. What is really wonderful is that many of our, our students at Ingenious were able to build that meaningful relationship with them when they are younger. 
so mm-hmm. we can have a meaningful conversation between the two of us and then relay that information to a parent, to family, to a college counselor, to peers who are saying, no, why are you looking at that school that really fits you versus, you know, this top mm-hmm. school? So I think, you know, again, there's that challenge of a cultural shift. I'm trying to be optimistic about this because as Heather pointed out, it is a community of really intelligent, compassionate, dedicated professionals who want to positively change um, this process. But it is definitely clunky and it's definitely really difficult. But I think I think there is some promise. I like the idea of a reset. I hope that that happens. Thank you so much for joining us today, Heather and Mary. I'm sure our listeners appreciate your insight. For more information, check out our blog linked in the episode description. If you have any questions or would like to request a topic for a future episode, go ahead and give us a follow and send us a message on social media with the hashtag Inside Admissions. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office.